after I broke up with my abusive ex, Liam, the world felt like it was spinning. It was a relief, a weight lifted, but it was also terrifying. The constant fear, the tension, the feeling of being trapped, it was gone, but replaced by this new, insidious fear. The fear of what Liam might do next. He wasn't the kind of man who took rejection well. He was manipulative, possessive, and had a dark streak that terrified me. I'd known it was wrong from the beginning, but his charm had blinded me. It had taken months, but I finally had the courage to leave. His initial reaction had been explosive. He'd grabbed my arm, his grip like a vice, and snarled. You can't leave me! You're mine! He hadn't struck me, not physically, but the threat was there, palpable in his eyes, in the way he held me. I'd fought back, my voice shaking. Let me go! I'm leaving! I pulled at his hand, trying to break free. His face contorted in rage. He shoved me hard against the wall, the air knocked out of me. I crumpled to the floor, my knees hitting the cold hardwood. He stood over me, towering, his face an ugly mask of fury. You think you can just walk away? He hissed, his voice a low growl. As I scrambled to my feet, he did something I'll never forget. He grabbed a knife from the kitchen counter, the blade glinting under the dim light. He held it to his neck, the point pressed against his skin, a thin line of crimson appearing. I'll kill myself, he screamed, his voice cracking. If you leave, I'll do it. I swear, I'll kill myself. That was it. The turning point. The moment I realized this wasn't love, it was a cage, and I was trapped. That night, I stayed with a friend, unable to go back. The next morning, I moved my belongings, my every step filled with a sense of dread, of what might happen. I was terrified that he'd follow me, that he'd hurt me, that he'd make good on his threat. He did come after me, though not as I expected. It wasn't a physical confrontation. It was a campaign of harassment. He'd turn up at places I frequented, lurking at the fringes, his eyes fixed on me. I'd see him across the street, his face twisted into a sneer, his hands clenched into fists. He'd call me, leave cryptic messages on my answering machine, sometimes just silence, punctuated by the sound of his heavy breathing. He'd send flowers, bouquets of blood-red roses, with his name scrawled on a card. I love you, come back to me. It was a constant reminder, a constant threat. He'd even sent me an email, a chillingly calm message. You've made me lose my mind. It read. If you don't see me, if you don't talk to me, I'll make you regret it. I'll make sure you never forget me. You've always loved my cat, right? Maybe you'll feel differently about me when you know what it feels like to lose something you love. The email sent a shiver down my spine. I knew what he was capable of. He was unpredictable, and he could be violent. I didn't want to give him the satisfaction of a reaction. I didn't respond. I was scared, but I was also determined. I wouldn't let him win. I wouldn't let him break me. I knew I had to do something to stop him, to protect myself. I contacted Liam's parents. It was a difficult decision, but I knew they would be concerned. I told them about the email, about the threats, about the fear he had instilled in me. They were shocked and horrified. They never believed me about Liam's abuse, claiming it was all in my head that I was overreacting. But this time, the evidence was undeniable. They promised to help. They confronted Liam, his parents pleading for him to stop. I don't know what they said, what happened. I didn't want to know. I just wanted it to be over. And it was. For a while. The calls stopped. The messages ceased. The flowers no longer arrived. The fear, though, remained. It lingered like a shadow, reminding me of what had been, of what could be. I began to rebuild my life. I moved, found a new job, made new friends. I tried to move on. But there was a part of me that remained frozen in time, haunted by the memories of what had happened. I tried to ignore it but I couldn't shake the feeling that Liam was still out there, watching me, waiting for the right moment to strike. It was a year later when the fear resurfaced. It was a normal day, like any other. I was at work, going through emails, when I spotted one from Liam. I froze. 
My heart pounded in my chest, my breath catching in my throat. It was a short, simple message. You're safe. It read. For now. My hands trembled as I reread the email. It was a taunt, a threat, a reminder that he was still watching me, that he could still hurt me. I knew then that I wouldn't be able to live like this, constantly looking over my shoulder, fearing for my safety. I had to do something. I had to find a way to stop him. But how? How could I stop a man who was obsessed with me, who was consumed by rage and jealousy, and who had threatened to harm me and those I loved? I started making changes, taking steps to protect myself. I changed my phone number, my email address, and my routine. I moved again, to a more secure building with a doorman. I joined a self-defense class, learning how to protect myself in case Liam ever came after me. I also started carrying a pepper spray, its small size offering a false sense of security, but a security I desperately needed. I knew that I was making myself into a prisoner in my own life. I was afraid to go out, afraid to be alone, afraid to trust anyone. The fear was a constant companion, a relentless shadow that never left my side. I thought I was safe. I thought I was finally free. Until I saw him again. It was a rainy afternoon. I was walking home from work, the city slicker reflecting the gray sky, the street lamps casting eerie shadows. I wasn't paying much attention to my surroundings, lost in my thoughts, when I saw him. He was standing across the street, his face hidden in the shadows of his hooded jacket. He was just a silhouette, but I knew it was him. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. My breath caught in my throat, my legs suddenly weak. He was closer now, the distance between us shrinking with every step. I started to run, my breath ragged, my feet pounding on the wet pavement. But he was faster, his long strides covering the ground with ease. He was gaining on me. The fear was a cold hand gripping my heart, constricting my chest, squeezing the air from my lungs. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't think. I could only run. I found myself in a narrow alleyway, the smell of garbage and dampness filling my nostrils. There was nowhere to go. He was behind me, his footsteps echoing off the brick walls, his shadow growing longer, darker. I turned to face him, my hands shaking, my voice trembling. Leave me alone, I whispered. Please, just leave me alone. He didn't say anything. He just stood there, his eyes burning into me, his face a mask of hatred. He was close, too close, his body filling my vision. I could smell his scent, a muskiness mixed with something metallic, like blood. He reached for my arm, his fingers brushing against my skin. I flinched away, my body trembling with fear. I just want to talk, he said, his voice a low growl. I just want to explain. There's nothing to explain, I said, my voice barely a whisper. Just leave. You don't get to walk away, he said, his voice rising, the anger palpable. You don't get to forget. His hand snaked around my wrist, his grip tight. I tried to pull away, but he was stronger. He was dragging me towards a dark corner of the alleyway, his face contorted in a grimace, his eyes burning with an intensity that sent chills down my spine. The fear was overwhelming. It consumed me, choked me, threatened to suffocate me. I couldn't fight back, couldn't scream, couldn't think. I was paralyzed by fear. He shoved me against the wall, the cold brick against my back, the rough surface digging into my skin. He was so close his breath was a hot, stinging blast on my face. I closed my eyes, waiting for the impact, waiting for the pain. And then I heard it. A screech of tires, a loud crash, a deafening roar. The sound of a car horn blaring. I opened my eyes, my vision blurry, my body trembling. He had let go of me. He was staring at the street, his face twisted in confusion. I took my chance. I pushed against him, my legs pumping, my feet pounding on the concrete. I ran, my lungs burning, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't dare look back. I didn't dare stop. I ran until my legs gave way, collapsing on a curb, my breath coming in ragged gasps my body shaking with exhaustion and fear. I was safe, for now. I had escaped. 
but I knew that this wasn't over. Liam was still out there, and he was still obsessed with me. I knew he wouldn't give up. As I sat there, catching my breath, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was trapped in a nightmare. A nightmare I couldn't wake up from. The fear was real, the danger was real, and Liam was still out there, waiting. I knew I had to fight, to protect myself, to survive. But how? How could I fight a man who was consumed by hatred? A man who had threatened to destroy me? A man who had already taken so much from me? I looked up at the gray sky, tears blurring my vision. The rain was starting to pour, the drops cold on my skin, mirroring the chill of fear that had settled in my bones. I had to find a way to stop him. Somehow, I had to survive. I had to find a way to live. I dated a girl in high school. We lost our virginity to each other. Once we started having sex, things took a dark turn. She became possessive, trying to control my every move. She forbade me from hanging out with my friends and demanded that I spend all my free time with her. At first, I tried to brush it off as a sign of her love for me. But her demands became increasingly unreasonable, and I realized that I couldn't continue living my life under her suffocating grip. So, after a few months, I broke up with her. That's when the real crazy began. She started showing up at my house, standing outside for hours on end, staring at me through the windows. She followed me everywhere I went, showing up at my work, my favorite restaurants, and even my gym. It was as if she had become obsessed with me, and there was nothing I could do to shake her off. Her mother called me, demanding that I take her daughter back. She told me that we were meant to be together because we had sex, and that it was my duty to marry her. I was shocked and disgusted by her words, but I knew that there was no way I could ever get back together with my ex. Things escalated quickly after that. My ex started leaving threatening messages on my phone, telling me that she would kill herself if I didn't take her back. She keyed my car, leaving deep scratches along the sides. I was afraid to leave my house, knowing that she could be waiting for me anywhere. My mother called the police several times, but they couldn't do much to help. They told me that I needed to get a restraining order, but even that didn't seem to stop her. She would show up at my house, skulking in the shadows, waiting for her chance to strike. I became a prisoner in my own home, too afraid to leave except for the most essential errands. I stopped hanging out with my friends, knowing that she would be there, watching me, waiting for me to slip up. I felt like I was losing my mind, trapped in a nightmare that I couldn't escape. And then, one day, it all came to a head. I was leaving the mall, my arms loaded with shopping bags, when I saw her standing there, in the parking lot. She was waiting for me, her eyes burning with anger and hatred. I knew that I had to get away from her, but I couldn't move. I was frozen in fear, paralyzed by the thought of what she might do. She started walking towards me, her fists clenched at her sides. I could see the rage in her eyes, the sheer madness that had taken over her mind. I knew that I had to defend myself, that I couldn't let her hurt me. And so, I did something that I never thought I would do. I raised my hand and struck her, knocking her to the ground. She lay there, motionless, for several long moments. I wasn't sure if she was alive or dead, but I didn't dare go near her. I just stood there, my heart racing, my mind spinning. And then, slowly, she started to stir. She sat up, her eyes blazing with fury. How could you do this to me? She screamed, her voice echoing through the parking lot. How could you hit me? I didn't have a choice. I said, my voice shaking. You were going to hurt me. You're a monster. She spat, her eyes filled with tears. A monster who deserves to die. And with that, she got up and stumbled away, leaving me alone in the parking lot. I watched her go, my heart heavy with dread. I knew that this wasn't the end, that she would be back, that she would never let me go. But I also knew that I couldn't let her control me any longer. I had to take back my life, to break free from her grip. And so, I started making plans. I changed my phone number, 
quit my job, and moved to a different town. I cut off all contact with my old friends, knowing that she would use them to find me. It wasn't easy, starting over from scratch. I had to build a new life, to create a new identity for myself. But it was worth it, knowing that I was finally free. Years went by, and I started to think that maybe she had finally moved on, that maybe she had forgotten about me. But then, one day, I got a call. It was her, her voice cold and distant. I know where you are, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. And I'm coming for you. I hung up the phone, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew that this was it, that she had finally snapped. I grabbed my keys and ran from my car, knowing that I had to get away before it was too late. But it was already too late. She was there, waiting for me, her eyes filled with a madness that I had never seen before. I knew that I had to defend myself, that I couldn't let her hurt me. And so, I did something that I never thought I would do again. I raised my hand and struck her, knocking her to the ground. She didn't get up this time. I stood there, my heart racing, my mind spinning. And then, slowly, I walked away, leaving her there, alone in the darkness. I never heard from her again, but I knew that she was still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for her chance to strike. And so, I lived my life in fear, always looking over my shoulder, always wondering if she would come back. Years went by, and I started to relax, to let my guard down. I thought that maybe she had finally given up, that maybe she had moved on. But I was wrong. One day, I got a call from the police. They told me that she had been found, dead in an alleyway, her body beaten and bruised. I knew that it was him, the monster that she had become, the monster that I had created. I went to her funeral, my heart heavy with guilt and regret. I knew that I could have done more, that I could have saved her. But I also knew that it was too late, that she was gone forever. As I stood there, among the mourners, I realized that I had made a terrible mistake. I had let fear control me, let it take over my life. And in doing so, I had lost the one thing that I had always wanted. My first serious boyfriend stalked me for about five years after I broke up with him. It started innocently enough, or so I thought at the time. He was charming, handsome, and older than me, which back then seemed like a good thing. He swept me off my feet with grand gestures and romantic declarations, painting a future of shared dreams and a love that would last a lifetime. But as the months turned into years, the cracks began to show. His possessiveness morphed into a suffocating control. My friends became bad influences, my family became overbearing, and my desire for independence became disloyalty. He insisted on knowing my every move, scrutinized my every word, and demanded constant reassurance of my love. He wanted me to be his entire world, and it felt like my own world was slowly shrinking around me. The breaking point came when he started demanding I quit my job because he felt it, distracted, me from our relationship. By then, I was already having nightmares about him, waking up in a cold sweat, my heart hammering in my chest. It wasn't love anymore, it was fear, a crippling fear that had taken root in the core of my being. I broke up with him, a decision that filled me with a mixture of relief and dread. He didn't take it well. He cried, screamed, begged his face a mask of raw agony. He pleaded for another chance, claiming he would change, that he loved me more than anything. But the fear was too deep, the trust shattered beyond repair. I knew, with a chilling certainty, that I had to get away. The initial aftermath felt like being caught in the aftermath of a storm. He bombarded me with texts and calls, his voice thick with desperation and a hint of something darker. He sent flowers to my workplace, each bouquet a silent plea for forgiveness. The attention was overwhelming, suffocating, and utterly terrifying. Six months later, it became clear this wasn't just the heartbroken ramblings of a rejected lover. I started seeing him everywhere. On my way home from work, he'd appear at the bus stop, his eyes burning into me, sending shivers down my spine. 
At the supermarket, he'd be in the same aisle, his gaze lingering on me, his presence a suffocating cloud. His face, once a symbol of love, had become a symbol of fear. Panic seized me. I couldn't live like this, constantly looking over my shoulder, fearing his next move. I moved, hoping to escape his grasp. I left behind my old life, my friends, my job, everything familiar, hoping to find a haven where he couldn't find me. It didn't work. He found my new apartment, the address seemingly appearing out of thin air. Again, he started appearing in the most unexpected places. At the local coffee shop, he'd be sitting at a table by the window, his eyes tracking my every movement. On the street, he'd emerge from the shadows, his presence a sudden, unwelcome apparition. Moving wasn't the answer. I needed to cut off all ties, sever the connection. I changed jobs, taking a position where I could avoid contact with the outside world. I deleted my social media accounts, cut off communication with anyone who might inadvertently reveal my location. I lived a life of isolation, the only human interaction I had being with my colleagues who didn't even know my real name. But the shadow of his presence still loomed over me. He found my new work address, appearing in the parking lot, his eyes cold and predatory, his presence a silent threat. His face, once a beacon of love, now a mask of obsession. Fear became my constant companion. I couldn't sleep, my mind racing with images of him, his eyes following me, his voice whispering threats in the dark. I couldn't eat, the food tasting like ash in my mouth, the fear turning my stomach into a knot of anxiety. I couldn't concentrate at work, my mind too consumed with the constant fear of his next appearance. I was a shell of my former self, a broken, hollowed-out vessel, the joy and laughter drained from my soul. My world shrank to the four walls of my apartment, a prison of my own making. I became a prisoner of my own fear, every sound, every shadow, a potential harbinger of his return. The police were reluctant to help. They dismissed my concerns as exaggerated, and harmless, failing to grasp the horrifying reality of my situation. They seemed to think it was just a case of a jilted lover, failing to comprehend the depths of his obsession, the chilling, calculated nature of his actions. He was like a phantom, appearing and disappearing at will, leaving behind a trail of fear and unease. He seemed to know my every move, my every thought, my every fear. It was a game, a twisted game, and I was the helpless, terrified pawn. Time became a blur of endless paranoia and anxiety. Each day was a constant battle against my own fear, trying to hold on to some semblance of normalcy, but it was a losing battle. The fear was always there, lurking in the shadows, a constant, gnawing presence. It felt like I was drowning in a sea of fear, pulling myself up on a rope of hope, only to have it snapped away plunging me back into the cold, dark depths. The worst part was the feeling of betrayal. I began to suspect everyone, my friends, my colleagues, even my family. Was one of them the leak, the weak link in my defenses, allowing him to find me? Was I surrounded by a conspiracy of silence, everyone complicit in his stalking? I started carrying pepper spray, avoiding dark alleys, looking for escape routes in every room. My world became a maze of paranoia, my every action dictated by the fear of his next move. Then came the phone call. It was a day like any other, shrouded in the usual fog of anxiety. I was working, trying to focus, but my mind was elsewhere, replaying his face, his cold, calculating eyes, his voice filled with an unnerving calm. The phone rang, breaking the silence. It was an unknown number, but I answered, my voice trembling. Hello? I whispered, my hand shaking as I clutched the receiver. The voice on the other end was quiet, almost a whisper, but a sinister undercurrent ran beneath the words. I know where you are. The words sent a shiver down my spine, a cold dread creeping into my heart. How? How did you find me? I managed to ask, my voice barely a croak. The voice on the other end chuckled, a low, menacing sound that sent shivers down my spine. It doesn't matter. What matters is that I'm watching you. I'm always watching you. The phone line went dead. My heart was pounding against my ribs, my breath coming in ragged gasps. 
I couldn't breathe, couldn't think. The world around me seemed to shrink, the walls closing in, suffocating me with fear. He knew where I was. He was watching me. I felt like a hunted animal, trapped in a predator's game, the fear a heavy weight in my chest. The next few months were a blur of fear-fueled paranoia. I felt like I was living in a nightmare, the reality of my situation becoming increasingly terrifying. But this time, something had changed. This time, I knew something had to be done. I reported him to the police again, this time with a newfound determination. I told them everything, the constant stalking, the threats, the phone call. This time, the fear in my voice was laced with a glimmer of defiance, a determination to fight back. The police, initially reluctant, this time took some action. They assigned me a caseworker, a detective who listened to my story with a sympathetic ear, a genuine concern etched on her face. She believed me. The detective, a woman named Laura, was relentless. She followed every lead, interviewed every witness, poring over evidence and piecing together the puzzle of my stalker's actions. I was still terrified, constantly looking over my shoulder, but Laura's determination gave me a sliver of hope. Then came the breakthrough. Laura called me one morning, her voice filled with excitement. They had finally found a connection, a link that tied everything together. He had been accessing my personal information through his job. He was working for the National Tax Office, and he had been using his position to get my new addresses and phone numbers. My heart sank. I had thought it was my friends, my colleagues, my family. I had suspected everyone, but I had never imagined it was him, using his job, his power, to track me down. The revelation was horrifying. He wasn't just a jilted lover. He was a calculating, obsessive stalker who had used his position to manipulate the system, to control my life, to hunt me down. He had a network, a web of connections, that allowed him to access information that was supposed to be private, confidential, hidden from prying eyes. He had used that power to track me down, to control my life, to make me his prisoner. The thought of him sitting at his computer, his fingers flying across the keyboard, accessing my information, knowing everything about me, sent a wave of nausea through me. The feeling of being violated, exposed, completely powerless, was overwhelming. Laura told me they were building a case against him, gathering evidence to expose his crimes and bring him to justice. My nightmare was finally coming to an end. Justice was on its way. But instead of a sense of relief, I felt a wave of dread. He was dangerous. My stalker ex leaked pictures of me in my underwear. It wasn't just some harmless teenage crush gone wrong. It was a calculated, venomous assault on my privacy, a deliberate attempt to humiliate and destroy me. The photos were sent to my friends, my family, even some of my co-workers. I felt violated, exposed, and utterly powerless. It was the first blow in a string of terrifying events that would scar me for life. But the leaking of those photos, as horrific as it was, was only the beginning. It was the prelude to a nightmare I couldn't have imagined, a nightmare that began with a chilling sense of unease and escalated into a fight for my very survival. The day it happened, I was sitting in my room, trying to ignore the relentless buzzing of my phone. It seemed like every notification was another message, another person I had to confront about the photos. My hands trembled as I scrolled through the messages, each one a fresh cut to my already bleeding heart. The world felt like it was closing in on me, suffocating me with its judgment and disapproval. My mother, recognizing the turmoil I was going through, tried to comfort me. She assured me that it was just a phase, that he would eventually move on, and that I would be stronger for having weathered this storm. I clung to her words, desperately seeking solace in her unwavering faith in me. But there was a growing sense of dread that I couldn't shake. The feeling of being watched, of being followed, intensified with each passing day. It was a constant whisper in the back of my mind, a gnawing fear that I couldn't escape. It was the kind of fear that makes your skin crawl and your heart pound, that turns ordinary shadows into lurking monsters. My ex, Ethan, 
was a master manipulator. He was charming, charismatic, and had a way of making you feel like you were the only person in the world that mattered to him. But behind that facade of warmth and affection lurked a darkness, a jealousy that festered like a festering wound. And as our relationship crumbled, that darkness spilled out, manifesting in a chilling obsession that bordered on insanity. After the photos, he started appearing everywhere. At my workplace, waiting by the entrance, his eyes burning into mine with a mixture of anger and longing. At the supermarket, lingering near the aisle where I was shopping, his presence a tangible weight in the air. Even at my favorite coffee shop, he would be there, sitting at a table near the window, watching me as I sipped my latte. The stalking was relentless, growing more brazen with each passing day. He would leave cryptic messages on my voicemail, his voice a sinister whisper in the quiet of my room. He would send me anonymous flowers, bouquets of lilies and roses that arrived on my doorstep with no sender. I became a prisoner in my own life, living in constant fear of encountering him. My once carefree life had become a minefield of paranoia and anxiety. I couldn't trust anyone, not even my own family. My mother, bless her heart, tried to protect me, but there was only so much she could do. I felt trapped, isolated, and utterly alone. One evening, I stayed late at work, desperate for the distraction of my job. I hoped that by keeping myself busy, I could forget about the constant fear that gnawed at my insides. But when I finally stepped out into the cool night air, the fear came rushing back. The street lights cast long, menacing shadows, and every rustle in the bushes sent a shiver down my spine. I quickened my pace, my heart pounding in my chest. I could feel him there, lurking in the darkness watching my every move. I saw his face, contorted in a mask of fury, his eyes like burning coals. I burst into the house, slamming the door behind me, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I didn't bother to lock the door, forgetting my usual routine in my panic state. I was used to living with my mother, who always made sure the doors were locked at night. But this time, I was alone and my fear had rendered me incapable of even the simplest safety measures. I needed a shower, to wash away the grime and the fear that clung to me like a second skin. As the water cascaded over my head, I momentarily forgot about Ethan. But as I stepped out, towel in hand, a strange feeling washed over me, a sense of being watched, a prickling sensation on the back of my neck. I turned slowly, scanning the room, but saw nothing. I convinced myself it was just my imagination, a trick played by my overactive brain. But the feeling persisted, growing stronger with each passing second. I walked toward my bedroom, my heart pounding in my chest. As I reached the doorway, I saw it. A shadow, a shape under my bed, barely visible in the faint light emanating from the hallway. It was him. It was Ethan. My blood ran cold. I was trapped. There was no escape. I couldn't run to the bathroom, couldn't even reach the phone on my nightstand. I was alone. I was about to become his next victim. I knew I had to act quickly, but my mind was racing. I thought about calling the police, but what if he heard me? What if he attacked me before they arrived? Suddenly, an idea struck me. I grabbed the phone, my hand shaking. I dialed my mother's number, my voice trembling. Mom, are you close? I might need you to pick something up, I said, my voice barely a whisper. Ma'am, you have contacted the wrong person, a woman's voice answered. Mom, I asked, are you close? I need help with something, I repeated, my voice growing desperate. Ma'am, are you unable to talk but need help? The voice asked. Yes, Mom, I choked out. Can you tell me your address? You'll need to put your name and street name and number on the envelope, Mom, I said, my voice gaining a little more strength. I had to stay calm, had to convince him I wasn't alone. Thank you, Mom. I'll send help immediately, the operator said. The second I put down the phone, I heard a rustle under the bed. Ethan was moving. I forced myself to turn and face him, pretending to be calm, pretending to be in control. We need to talk, Intawakiafkas, he said, his voice a menacing whisper. Look, I don't want to disturb you, but did you get my letter? Yes, 
I said, my voice shaking, trying to buy myself time. I need some time to think about it. Would you like some tea? I forced a smile, my heart pounding against my ribs. I willed the police to come, my mind fixated on their arrival. It felt like an eternity, every second amplifying the fear that gnawed at my insides. Then, a knock at the front door. My heart leaped in my chest. My salvation had arrived. I ran to the door, tears streaming down my face. I threw it open, barely managing to stop myself from flinging myself into the arms of the two police officers standing on my porch. He's here. I choked out, pointing at Ethan, who was standing calmly near the window. He's been stalking me, threatening me. He was under my bed. I called you. Ethan began to protest, his voice smooth and persuasive. She's lying. I came here to talk. She's being irrational. We just had a fight. There's no need for this. The police officers exchanged glances, but their expressions didn't waver. They searched Ethan, their hands moving swiftly and efficiently. A glint of metal flashed in the dim light of the hallway. A knife, one of the officers said, his voice grim. And a Beretta. You carrying a license for that? Ethan's composure crumbled. His face twisted in a grimace of anger and fear. He could no longer maintain his charade, his facade of innocence shattering like a fragile mask. They arrested him, the handcuffs clicking shut with a resounding finality. He was charged with carrying a concealed weapon without a license, trespassing, and making threats. In the aftermath of the terrifying encounter, I was left feeling shaken and vulnerable. I was a survivor, yes, but also a victim of a man who had managed to infiltrate my life, poisoning it with his twisted obsession. The scars of that night, both physical and emotional, would remain with me for years to come. The restraining order granted against him offered a semblance of protection, a legal barrier against his attempts to contact me or come near me. But it didn't erase the fear, the constant sense of unease that followed me everywhere I went. I started to lock my doors, even when my mother was home. Every night, before I went to sleep, I checked under the bed, making sure there was nothing lurking in the shadows, nothing to remind me of the terrifying encounter that had almost cost me my life. I installed alarm systems, changed my routine, and learned to live in a world where I was always on guard. But despite my precautions, I could never fully shake the feeling of being watched, the knowledge that my life had been irrevocably altered by the actions of a man who had once claimed to love me. The nightmares came often, vivid and terrifying. In them, I would see Ethan's face, his eyes burning into mine, his voice whispering threats in my ear. I would feel the icy chill of fear, the sense of helplessness, as he closed in on me. I would wake up sweating, my heart pounding, my mind racing with the horrors of the night. It was a long and arduous journey, a painful process of healing and recovery. But with time, with the support of my family and friends, with the strength I found within myself, I began to rebuild my life. I learned to trust again, to open my heart to love, to find joy in the simple things. But the shadow of that night, the chilling memory of the man hiding under my bed, would forever linger in my mind, a constant reminder of the darkness that can lurk in the hearts of those we love, and the fragility of the line between love and obsession. The scars of that night, both physical and emotional, would forever remain. But I would not let them define me. I would not let Ethan win. I would emerge from the darkness stronger, more resilient, more determined to live my life on my own terms, free from the shadow of his obsession. I was thirteen, she was seventeen. At first, I thought she was the most beautiful girl I had ever seen. She had long, curly brown hair, bright green eyes, and a smile that could light up a room. We met at the local community center, where I would go to shoot hoops after school. She would come in and watch, flirting with me from across the room. I was flattered by the attention, but I didn't think much of it. I was just a kid, and she was a high school girl. But she had other plans. She started seeking me out, talking to me, and making me feel special. She would tell me how mature I was for my age, 
how much she loved spending time with me, and how she couldn't wait to see me every day. I was flattered and overwhelmed by all the attention she was giving me. I had never had a girlfriend before, and I didn't know how to handle it. She was good at what she did. She knew just what to say and how to act to make me feel like I was the most important person in her life. But looking back, I can see now that it was all an act. She was manipulating me, playing with my emotions, and using me for her own entertainment. One day, she asked me to be her boyfriend. I was hesitant at first, but she convinced me that it was the right thing to do. She told me how happy we would be together, and how much she loved me. I was innocent, and I believed her. I thought that I had found my first love. But things took a dark turn quickly. She started to become more demanding, wanting to spend all of her time with me, and getting angry when I couldn't. She would make me feel guilty for wanting to spend time with my friends, telling me that I didn't love her if I couldn't make time for her. It wasn't long before she forced me into having sex with her. I was scared and confused, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to lose her, so I went along with it. But I knew it was wrong, and I regretted it immediately. I was just a child, and she took advantage of me. After that, she began to blackmail me. She told me that if I ever left her, she would tell everyone about what we had done. She said that I would be in big trouble if anyone found out, and that I would be labeled as a pervert and a predator. I was terrified. I didn't know what to do, and I felt like I had no way out. She also made me send her pictures of myself. She said that she needed them to prove that I loved her, and that I couldn't refuse. I was worried about what she would do with the pictures but I felt like I had no choice. I sent them to her, hoping that it would be enough to keep her happy. But it wasn't. She continued to blackmail me, using the pictures to manipulate me and control me. I was trapped in a cycle of abuse, and I didn't know how to escape. I felt scared and alone, with no one to turn to. This went on for seven long months. I missed out on so much during that time, as I was isolated from my friends and family. I was constantly on edge, waiting for the next demand or threat from her. I was living in fear, and it was taking a toll on my physical and mental health. But one day, my mother found her dragging me out of the front door. I was trying to leave, to escape from her, but she wouldn't let me go. My mother could see the fear in my eyes, and she knew something was wrong. She stepped in, confronting my abuser, and demanding that she leave me alone. My abuser realizing that she had been caught, tried to deny everything. But my mother could see through her lies, and she knew that I was telling the truth. She called the police, and my abuser was arrested. I was relieved that it was finally over, but I was also terrified. I didn't know what would happen next, or how this would affect my life. I was afraid that people would judge me, or that they would think that I was to blame. I was scared that my abuser would come after me again and that I would never be truly safe. But as time went on, I started to heal. I went to therapy, and I talked about what had happened to me. I learned that it wasn't my fault, and that I wasn't to blame. I started to rebuild my relationships with my friends and family, and I began to feel like myself again. I also learned that I wasn't alone. There were other people who had gone through similar experiences, and they were there to support me. I joined a support group, and I started to talk to other survivors. They helped me to understand that I wasn't alone, and that I could heal from this trauma. It's been several years now, and I'm still healing. I have my ups and downs, but I'm getting better every day. I've learned to trust again, and I've fallen in love. I have a bright future ahead of me, and I'm excited to see what it holds. But I will never forget what happened to me. I will always remember the fear and the pain, and I will always be an advocate for other survivors. I will speak out against sexual abuse and assault, and I will work to make sure that no one else has to go through what I did. I was 13, she was 17. She manipulated me into dating her, then forced me into having sex with her. She blackmailed me, using pictures to further control me. This went on for seven months, but I survived. I am a survivor, and I am strong.
I worked at a convenience store. It wasn't glamorous, but it was a job, and at seventeen, I was happy to have one. The pay was decent, the customers were mostly friendly, and the nights weren't too bad. The only downside was the constant influx of customers from the halfway house around the corner. The halfway house was a place for people struggling with various mental health issues. Many were on medication, others were unstable, and a few you could tell just weren't quite right in the head. They'd come into the store, their eyes glazed over, their minds somewhere else. Most were harmless enough, but there was one woman who always unsettled me. From a distance, she seemed normal enough. But up close, something was a little off. Her makeup was a bit weird. She'd wear bright red lipstick, sometimes yellow or bright pink, always a bit messy. Her clothes were always the same, a faded floral dress and a worn-out cardigan. And she walked around with a perpetual air of confusion, her eyes flitting from one thing to another. I remember the first time she entered the store. She bought a thirty-cent pack of gum, handing me a ten-dollar bill. As I was giving her change, she stared at me in a very creepy way, her eyes unblinking, her gaze fixed on my face. Then, she complimented me, her voice unnervingly saccharine. You're so pretty and beautiful. I want to be like you. She spoke with an unsettling grin. Ha ha, thanks, here's your change. I mumbled, feeling a chill run down my spine. You know I have a million dollars? She continued, her voice a sing-song. I'm also going to marry Ryan Seacrest, and we're going to live on a big house on the moon. I would tell you where I hid my million dollars, but I have the power to not tell you. She winked, a manic glint in her eye. Okay, I said utterly bewildered, and she drifted off into the night. Ah, uh, just one of the loonies from around the corner, I told my friend later, trying to laugh it off. They never cause any harm. But it wasn't as simple as that. She started frequenting the store more and more, often just wandering around, her gaze fixed on me. She never spoke, just silently smiled at me, her eyes following my every move. I felt like I was being watched, scrutinized, judged. She seemed to delight in my discomfort, her presence like a cold, clammy hand on the back of my neck. She's creepy as fuck, my friend said, rolling his eyes. Like seriously creepy. You need to watch out. My unease grew. She wasn't just in the store anymore. She started showing up everywhere. I would be walking my dog, and she would be staring at me from behind a car, her face a mask of unnerving intensity. I would be sitting on my balcony, enjoying the sunset, and she would shout, Hey, Thought Factory! You look so pretty today! She would follow me down the aisles of the grocery store, giggling and whispering to herself her eyes glinting with a manic sparkle. When I'd turn, she would bolt away. I began carrying pepper spray, just in case. One day, she showed up at my door. It was late, almost midnight. I was in my pajamas, watching TV, when I heard a knock. I peeked through the peephole and saw her standing there, her eyes wide with a mixture of excitement and desperation. I hesitated, wondering what to do. Hello? She called out, her voice oddly quiet. I opened the door a crack. What do you want? I asked, my voice tight with apprehension. I... I wanted to see if you were in here. She said, her eyes scanning the interior of my apartment. Do you have a phone I could borrow? Go use the one outside. I said, my voice a bit harsh. It's only like thirty-five cents. I don't have thirty-five cents. She mumbled her eyes downcast. Yeah, well, you can't be in here, I said, moving to close the door. Wait, she cried, her voice suddenly frantic. Please? I just need to make a call. I hesitated, torn between my fear and the nagging feeling that she might be in trouble. It's important, she pleaded, her hands clutching the worn-out fabric of her dress. I sighed, feeling defeated. Okay, but make it quick. I said, opening the door wider. She stepped inside, her eyes darting around the room, taking in every detail. She seemed to be looking for something, but I couldn't tell what. I felt a sudden urge to close the door again, but I was too late. Where's your phone? She asked, her voice tight with a strange urgency. 
I pointed to the kitchen counter. Right there, I said, backing away slowly. She darted over to the counter, her eyes glued to the phone. She picked it up, her fingers fumbling with it. I stood by the door, watching her closely, my hand instinctively reaching for the pepper spray in my pocket. She finally managed to unlock the phone, her eyes darting around the room again. She seemed to be searching for something, her gaze falling on the pictures on the fridge. I felt a sudden chill run down my spine. Who's this? She asked, her voice a whisper, as she pointed to a picture of my family. My family, I said, my voice tight with fear. She didn't respond. She just stared at the picture, her eyes wide with a strange intensity. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. This wasn't normal. Do you have any more pictures? She asked, her voice barely a whisper. Yeah. I do. Why? I like looking at them. She said, her eyes still glued to the picture. You can't just be in my house. I said, my voice rising in panic. You need to leave now. She didn't move. She just stared at the picture, her eyes fixed on the smiling faces of my family. I like you, you're pretty, she said, her voice a soft, melodic hum. We could be friends. No, we can't. You have to leave, I said, my voice cracking under the pressure. She finally looked away from the picture, her gaze falling on me. Her eyes were wide, unblinking, her expression a mixture of adoration and hunger. But you're so beautiful, she whispered, her voice laced with a strange yearning. I want to be you. I felt a cold wave of fear wash over me. Something was wrong. This wasn't a simple case of a mentally troubled woman needing a phone call. Get out, I yelled, my voice shaking. She took a step closer, her eyes fixed on me. I saw a flicker of something dark in her eyes, something sinister and primal. I knew I had to get her out of my apartment, and fast. Why do you have to be so mean? She asked, her voice tinged with a hint of sadness. I just want to be your friend. I didn't answer. I just backed away, my eyes trained on her, my hands still gripping the pepper spray in my pocket. Why don't you let me help you? She asked, her voice dropping to a whisper. I can make you beautiful, like me. I felt a shiver run down my spine. This was beyond creepy. This was dangerous. Get out! I yelled again, my voice rising in panic. Get out of my house! She didn't move. She just stood there, her eyes locked on mine, a strange smile playing on her lips. Why, Thought Factory? She asked, her voice a seductive whisper. Why don't you let me be your friend? I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. I looked around, desperately searching for something, anything, to protect myself. My eyes fell on the kitchen knife, sitting on the counter next to the phone. I had to do something. Get out! I yelled again, my voice trembling. Get out! Now! She didn't move. She just stood there, her eyes fixed on me, her smile widening, a chillingly beautiful, disturbing smile. I couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed the knife my hand shaking, and pointed it at her. Get out! I yelled, my voice a strained whisper. Get out! Before I hurt you! The moment I grabbed the knife, the air seemed to change. Her smile vanished, replaced by a flicker of something I can only describe as fear. She finally turned and backed away, her eyes fixed on me, her face full of a strange mixture of terror and anger. I'll be back, she whispered, a chilling threat. You can't hide from me, Thought Factory. I'll find you. And then she was gone. I stood there, frozen, the knife still in my hand, my heart pounding against my ribs. I felt a cold sweat break out on my skin, my breath coming in ragged gasps. What had just happened? I was in shock, my mind racing, trying to make sense of it all. A few minutes later, my parents came home. I told them what happened, my voice trembling my words coming out in a rush. My mother hugged me tight, whispering soothing words of comfort. My father, always the pragmatist, took the knife from me, his face grim. We need to call the police, he said. This isn't normal. We called the police, and they came and took a report. 
They checked the apartment for any signs of forced entry, but there was nothing. The woman hadn't left any fingerprints, and all she took was a few of my father's socks. I was relieved that she hadn't taken anything more valuable, but it didn't make me feel any safer. The woman was still out there, and I knew she wouldn't give up. The police left, but the fear remained. I couldn't sleep. Every shadow seemed to hold a threat, every creak of the floorboards a warning. I felt like I was being watched, followed, hunted. I couldn't even go to work without looking over my shoulder, my heart pounding with each passing moment. I told my friends about it, and they were all horrified. They warned me to be careful, to stay away from the halfway house, to keep my doors locked. But I knew that wasn't enough. The woman was still out there, her obsession with me growing stronger with each passing day. With each passing day, my fear grew. She was everywhere, always there, watching, waiting, her gaze fixed on me, her manic smile a constant reminder of her presence. I couldn't escape her. She was in my dreams, my nightmares, my thoughts. I was trapped. The police were no help. They had taken my report, but they didn't seem concerned. They told me to keep my doors locked and be careful. But how could I be careful? I was being stalked followed, haunted by this woman, and I didn't know what to do. I tried to ignore her. I tried to put it out of my mind. But I couldn't. The fear was too real, too intense, too constant. She was a shadow, a haunting presence, a constant threat. And then, one night I got a call. I recognized the number. It was the halfway house. Hello? I asked, my voice a shaky whisper. We need to talk to you said a voice on the other end. It's about the woman who's been stalking you. I felt a chill run down my spine. I knew what was coming. We found her. The voice continued. She's dead. My breath caught in my throat. Dead? How? Why? She? She was found in her room, the voice said, a hint of sadness in its tone. No one knows what happened. Or why? I felt a wave of relief wash over me. She was gone. She was finally gone. But I also felt a strange sense of unease, a feeling of guilt and sadness. She was a troubled woman, a victim of circumstance, and now she was dead. I couldn't ignore the fact that I had been terrified of her, that I had even threatened her with a knife. I had been scared, but I had also been cruel. It's a shame, I said, my voice barely a whisper. What happened? She was found in the middle of the night, sitting at her table, writing. There was a notebook next to her. She must have died during the night. They think she may have had a heart attack or a stroke, the voice said. The notebook? I asked, feeling an odd sense of curiosity. What was in it? You know, a lot of people think it was a journal. But it was just pages and pages of your name, over and over. It was like, the obsessive way she wrote your name, it was like it was a spell or a chant or something. That's what we were trying to tell you in the first place, she was obsessed. I hope you're safe now, and I hope you go get some rest. I felt a shiver run down my spine. She had been obsessed with me, writing my name over and over, like a chant, a spell. It was both horrifying and pathetic. The fear finally started to subside. I had finally been freed from the clutches of that woman. But the experience had left a permanent scar on me, a reminder of the fragility of life and the power of obsession. The world was a stranger, more dangerous place than I had ever imagined. I never found out what had happened to her, but I knew her obsession with me had been real, her presence a constant threat, a chilling reminder of the darkness that lurked beneath the surface of ordinary life. The notebook was never discussed, and her death was never explained. I still worked at the convenience store, and I still saw the people from the halfway house, but I never forgot the woman who had haunted my life. She was a ghost, a phantom, a reminder of the fear I had faced, the terror I had endured. And sometimes, in the dead of night, I still hear her voice, whispering my name, her eyes filled with a strange, unsettling intensity. The terror, I thought, never truly goes away. It just hides, waiting for the right moment to resurface.
I was a reasonably good-looking early twenties male, with a mop of unruly brown hair, a gap-toothed smile that seemed to disarm people, and eyes that, according to my mother, held a certain melancholy charm. I was also a decent personality, or at least that's what my friends and colleagues would say. I was witty, engaging, and had a knack for making people laugh. All of this had led me to a career in radio, which, to my surprise, I found I truly enjoyed. The job, working at KRML, a local station in the sleepy town of Millhaven, was a far cry from the fast-paced life I had envisioned for myself after college. But I was unexpectedly content, surrounded by the comforting hum of the control panel and the constant flow of music and talk shows. After a few years, I became a semi-regular on the airwaves, hosting a late-night show called The Midnight Hour. My show was a mix of music, witty banter, and listener calls, and to my pleasant surprise, it gained a following. Naturally, with popularity came a certain level of attention, the kind that made a young man like me feel a little bit special. I was flattered by the occasional, fan mail, and the whispers of admiration from listeners who, through the magic of radio, felt like they knew me. Most of my fans were harmless, their admiration bordering on friendly obsession. But there was one, a woman named Sarah, who stood out from the crowd. She started by calling the radio program more and more often, her voice, a high-pitched, almost breathless whisper, becoming a familiar presence. She'd call to discuss song choices, share her opinions on upcoming events, or merely to tell me what her day had held, every detail narrated in a voice that resonated with a hint of desperate longing. Initially, I found her calls endearing. Sarah was a true fan, her dedication to the show touching. However, her calls became increasingly frequent, bordering on the obsessive. Sarah started calling not just during my show, but at random times during the day, leaving messages on the station's answering machine. It quickly became clear that Sarah's devotion had morphed into something unsettling. Soon, the calls were no longer enough. Sarah began showing up at the station, always around the time I'd be leaving. She'd be waiting in the parking lot, a small, unassuming figure clad in nondescript clothing, her face lit by the faint glow of her phone screen, her eyes, when they met mine, filled with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. If I was ever out and about, doing a live broadcast or attending a public event, she would always show up, her presence a constant, unwelcome shadow. Her presence began to feel invasive, a violation of my personal space. I started avoiding eye contact, my smile turning into a tight, nervous grimace. I grew increasingly anxious, fearing that she might follow me home, her presence lingering in the quiet of my apartment, a constant reminder of her unwanted attention. One day, I was doing a live broadcast from a local coffee shop when I felt her presence behind me. I was in the middle of a segment about the latest music releases when I sensed her gaze on the back of my neck. My voice wavered slightly, the familiar warmth that always accompanied my on-air presence replaced by a prickling sense of unease. When the broadcast ended, I was eager to leave, my every sense on high alert. I could feel her eyes on me as I walked to my car, the street lamp casting long, distorted shadows that stretched like accusing fingers. I wanted to run, just to be away from her, from the unsettling feeling of being watched. As I drove home, I decided to take a different route, a small act of defiance against my stalker's unwanted attention. But as I turned onto the unfamiliar road, a small, silver car, its headlights catching my rear-view mirror, followed closely behind me. Panic began to surge through me, my pulse quickening, my hands clammy on the steering wheel. I knew it was her. Her presence had become a tangible threat, a dark cloud hovering over my life. I couldn't understand why she was doing this. What had made her so fixated on me? Was she truly dangerous, or was this just a twisted form of admiration, a warped version of the fan devotion I had initially found charming? I started taking precautions, small acts of counter-surveillance that I had learned from the police. I varied my route home, making random turns, leaving work at different times, trying desperately to break the pattern, to disappear from her radar but it seemed she was always one step ahead. She always found me. One evening, I was leaving the station, exhausted from a particularly long day of recording, 
my mind numb from the constant drone of the microphone. I was completely oblivious to my surroundings, lost in my own thoughts. As I pulled out of the parking lot, I saw her car in my rearview mirror. My heart sank, a cold dread settling in my stomach. I was tired. I wanted nothing more than to go home, to crawl into bed and forget about the world. But I knew I couldn't go straight home. I had to shake her off. I drove, following my usual route, my mind racing, my hands shaking on the steering wheel. But the silver car was always there, a steady presence in my rearview mirror. This time, I felt a new level of fear, a primal instinct that told me she was becoming increasingly bold, her obsession growing more dangerous. As I approached my apartment complex, I saw her car parked across the street, its headlights illuminating the facade of my building. I knew I couldn't go in. I had to get away from her, to escape her unwanted attention. I turned off the engine and left it running, my heart pounding in my chest, my breath coming in short, sharp gasps. I drove around the complex, making several circles, my eyes scanning the parking lot for any sign of her. She was still there, watching me, her small, silver car a constant reminder of her presence. I couldn't shake off the feeling that she was watching me, her eyes burning into the back of my neck. I finally decided to make a run for it. I couldn't let her know where I lived. I couldn't risk her coming to my apartment, to becoming a part of my life, a constant threat that I couldn't escape. I turned the car around and drove away, my heart hammering in my chest. I knew I couldn't go back to my apartment. I was running out of options, my mind racing, trying to find a safe place to go. I drove towards the police station, a sense of desperation fueling my actions. I needed to report her, to get help, to stop her before she did something worse. I needed to break free from her grasp, to regain control of my life. As I approached the station, I saw her car in my rearview mirror again. She was still following me, her persistence unwavering. The only thing that mattered now was escaping her, leaving her behind. I drove a few blocks past the station before deciding to take a chance. I turned into a small side street, my tires screaming as I skidded around the corner, hoping to lose her. The street was dark, lined with dilapidated buildings, the silence broken only by the occasional distant car horn. I slowed down, my heart still pounding in my chest. I checked my rear-view mirror expecting to see her car. But the street was empty. She was gone. I parked the car and sat there for a moment, trying to catch my breath. I felt a wave of relief wash over me, but it was quickly replaced by a sense of unease. She was still out there, somewhere, watching me. I just didn't know where. I returned to the police station and reported the incident. The officers listened patiently, their faces a mixture of concern and skepticism. They took down my information and promised to look into it, but their words offered little comfort. I knew they were already dealing with far more serious crimes than a case of a stalker obsessed with a radio DJ. The next few weeks were a blur of anxiety and anticipation. I went about my daily routine, but I was always looking over my shoulder, my senses on high alert. I changed my habits, my routines, trying to keep her from finding me. But she was always one step ahead her presence a constant shadow hovering over my life. One morning, I received a call from the police. The officer on the other end of the line informed me that they had run a license plate check on the silver car and had identified its owner, Sarah. They had also discovered that she was a regular caller to Carmel and that she had often mentioned her admiration for me. The officer said they had visited Sarah at her home, but she refused to speak with them. She had a clear alibi for the night of the incident at the apartment complex. She had been at a friend's house, watching a movie. The officer's words were a blow to my hopes. It seemed I was caught in a bizarre game of cat and mouse, with no clear resolution in sight. The knowledge that Sarah was a real person, a person with a life outside of her obsession with me, was both terrifying and confusing. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't live my life in fear but I also couldn't shake the feeling that she was out there, watching me, her obsession simmering just below the surface. Then, one day, it just stopped. No more calls, no more appearances, no more sightings. 
she simply disappeared from my life. It was a strange and unsettling feeling, like a cloud lifting, revealing a world I had almost forgotten. A few weeks later, I overheard a group of employees at the station discussing a new DJ at a rival station across town. He was apparently a charismatic young man, with a voice as smooth as velvet, and a smile that had the entire female staff swooning. When I asked about him, one of the employees told me that Sarah, the woman who had been stalking me, was now a regular caller to the rival station's late-night show, making frequent calls, gushing about the new DJ in the same breathless whisper that had once sent chills down my spine. I was relieved. It was like a weight had been lifted from my shoulders. But I couldn't shake the feeling that this was only a temporary reprieve. The feeling that someone was watching, waiting, kept lingering in the back of my mind. That evening, I decided to call the new DJ, to give him a friendly heads-up about Sarah, to warn him about the strange and dangerous affection she could hold for a man she barely knew. I told him about the calls, the appearances, the eerie feeling of being watched, the fear of becoming entangled in her obsession. He listened intently, his voice a mix of amusement and concern. Thanks for the heads-up, man, he said. I'll be careful. I hung up the phone, feeling a strange mixture of relief and unease. Sarah was gone from my life, but the experience had left a permanent mark on me, a deep scar that I knew would never fully heal. The world felt a little less safe, a little more uncertain. And I knew that even though she was gone, she was still out there, somewhere, lurking in the shadows, waiting for her next target. The thought made me shudder, a shiver running down my spine and I knew that this was a story that would stay with me forever. I had a couple of stalkers, but the worst one was the guy that raped me a few years back. He was a monster, and the police never found him. His name was David, a name I can never bring myself to say out loud. I can still see his face his piercing blue eyes filled with a mixture of rage and lust. He was a hulking man, almost six feet tall, with a thick build and a face that could crack stones. I was only twenty-two when it happened. I was studying for my finals in the library, late at night, when I heard a noise behind me. I turned around to see David, his face shrouded in shadows. Before I could even scream, he grabbed me, his grip tight and unrelenting. He dragged me to the back of the library, into the dark and silent depths. I fought him, but it was no use. He was too strong. I remember the raw fear, the desperate pleas for mercy that were met with his chilling silence. The pain, the violation, the utter helplessness. The memory is a gaping wound in my mind, a constant reminder of the night my life was shattered. After the attack, I reported it to the police. I told them everything the date, the time, the place, the details of David's appearance. They investigated, but they couldn't find him. They couldn't even get a lead. They told me to move on, to forget about it. But how could I? How could I forget about the searing pain, the constant fear, the feeling of utter vulnerability? The nightmare didn't end there. In the months following the attack, David began to stalk me. I'd see his truck, a beat-up Ford F-150 with a dented bumper parked behind me at the grocery store, or following me on the highway. It would creep along slowly, almost taunting me. I'd see it parked across the street from my apartment building, or lingering in the parking lot of the coffee shop where I worked. I would drive home, my heart pounding against my ribs, my mind racing, wondering if he was watching me from somewhere in the shadows. He was particularly fond of haunting the two places I worked, a local bakery and a small bookstore. He seemed to take pleasure in driving by slowly, as if to remind me of his presence. The fear started to consume me. Every time I heard a loud noise I'd jump. Every shadow seemed to hold a threat. Every car that passed my house looked like his truck. I began to avoid going out, staying indoors as much as possible. I even considered leaving the city, but I was afraid to run. If I left, wouldn't he find me somewhere else? The police could do nothing. My case was closed. The investigation was over. They told me he was probably just a nuisance, a guy with a fixation on me. 
They said he wouldn't hurt me again. But I couldn't shake the feeling that they were wrong. I knew in my gut that he was capable of anything. One day, I was driving home from work when I saw him. He was sitting in his truck parked across the street from my apartment building, his face obscured by the shadows of his baseball cap. I slammed on the brakes, my heart pounding like a drum. I knew that I was in danger. I had to get out of there. I turned the car around and drove in the opposite direction, my mind racing, trying to figure out what to do. I didn't know if he was following me, but fear froze me into inaction. I ended up driving for hours, just trying to get away, trying to put distance between myself and him. As the hours went by, my fear began to dissolve into a cold, hard resolve. I couldn't live like this anymore. I couldn't run from him. I had to confront him, to fight back. I drove back to my apartment building, my hands shaking as I pulled into the parking lot. I grabbed my keys and ran inside, my heart pounding as I searched for my phone. I had to call the police. I dialed 911 and reported what had happened. I told them that I had been stalked, that I feared for my life. They promised to send someone over, but I knew it would be too late. I had to get out of there. I grabbed a few essentials, stuffed them into a bag, and ran out the door. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I had to get away from him. He would find me if I stayed. I drove all night, my eyes blurry with exhaustion and fear. I kept the radio on, trying to distract myself, but my thoughts kept returning to him, to his menacing face, his cold eyes. I finally stopped at a gas station a few hours away from my apartment. I needed to figure out what to do next. I couldn't stay in the state. He might find me here. I needed to disappear. I drove for another hour before I came across a sign for a motel. It looked like a rundown place, but it was better than being out on the road. I checked in, my hands shaking as I signed the register. I had to do something. I couldn't keep running. This was just a temporary fix. I needed to make a long-term plan. I called my sister, who lived in California. She was horrified when she heard about what had happened. She told me I had to come stay with her. It was the best thing I could do. I could start over there. I could make a new life. The next day, I packed my car and drove to California. I left everything behind, my apartment, my job, my friends. It was a fresh start, a chance to rebuild my life. But the fear didn't go away. It never did. It lived inside me, a constant shadow. After I moved to California, I felt like I had escaped my nightmare. I found a job, started going to therapy, and slowly began to put my life back together. I started to date again, trying to find some semblance of normalcy. But the fear was always there, lurking beneath the surface. I was always looking over my shoulder, waiting for him to reappear. Over a year after I moved, I started to get strange phone calls, voicemails, and texts from numbers I didn't recognize. Some of the calls were just heavy breathing or loud noises, then hang-ups. Sometimes I'd get a text that just said, Who is this? Or nothing at all. The fear came back with a vengeance. It was like he was back in my life, tormenting me from a distance. The voicemails were the worst. I'd listen to them over and over trying to make out words, trying to find some clue as to who was calling. I could never quite make out the voices, they were distorted and muffled, but I could feel the menace behind them. I could feel the chilling familiarity. The phone calls came at all times of day and night, sometimes interrupting my sleep, sometimes jolting me out of a meeting. It was a constant reminder that I was not safe. And it was a constant torment. It was then that I started to suspect that it was David calling from some anonymous, untraceable number. I started to document everything, the phone calls, the texts, the times of day they came. I kept a journal, a meticulous record of every encounter. I was determined to find out who was harassing me, to expose them, to find justice. One night, I was doing my usual late-night ritual of checking my phone for any new messages when I saw something that made my blood run cold. There was a new call from a number I didn't recognize. The number looked similar to one of the numbers that had been calling me before, but with a slight difference. 
I hesitated, my heart pounding against my ribs. I knew I should just ignore it, but I couldn't resist the urge to answer. Hello? I said, my voice trembling. There was no answer, only heavy breathing. I hung up quickly, my mind racing. I felt a wave of panic wash over me. I knew that I had to do something. I couldn't live with this fear, this constant feeling of threat. I had to figure out who was harassing me, who was calling me from these anonymous numbers. I started to investigate. I looked up the numbers online, but I couldn't find any information. They were untraceable. I called the police, but they said there was nothing they could do. They told me to ignore the calls, that it was probably just some prankster. But I knew in my gut that it wasn't a prank. I knew that it was someone who knew me, someone who wanted to hurt me. I had to find out who it was, no matter what. I spent weeks trying to track down the callers, following every lead, every hunch, but it was like chasing a ghost. The calls continued, sometimes more often, sometimes less, but they never stopped. It was like they were taunting me, tormenting me, reminding me that I was never safe. I felt trapped. I felt like I was losing my mind. I was becoming paranoid, seeing threats everywhere, in every shadow, in every noise. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't focus. I was living in constant fear. Then, one day, I was driving home from work when I saw a truck. It looked familiar. It was a beat-up Ford F-150, with a dented bumper. A chill ran down my spine. It was his truck. I had seen it before. I had seen it in the parking lot of the bookstore, outside my apartment building, following me home. I knew then that he was back. He was in California. He was watching me. I drove past the truck, my mind racing, trying to figure out what to do. I knew that I couldn't just ignore it anymore. I had to find a way to protect myself. I pulled over into a parking lot, my hands trembling. I grabbed my phone and called my sister, my voice trembling as I told her what I'd seen. I told her that it was him, the man who raped me, the man who stalked me, the man who had haunted my every waking moment for years. I knew he was watching me, and I was terrified. My sister listened, her voice calm and reassuring. She told me she'd come over right away. She told me to stay safe to lock all the doors and windows, to stay inside until she got there. I hung up the phone and pulled myself together. I had to do something. I had to find a way to protect myself. I drove home, every muscle in my body tense, my mind racing. I made sure all the doors and windows were locked, and I sat down on the couch, my eyes scanning the room, looking for any sign of danger. I couldn't leave the house. I was trapped. I sat there for hours, waiting for my sister to arrive, the phone glued to my ear, constantly checking for a call from her, the sound of her voice the only thing that could calm the storm raging inside me. I watched the clock, each tick echoing the thud of my heart. I couldn't shake the feeling that he was watching me, that he was waiting for his chance. Finally, I heard a knock on the door. I jumped up, my heart pounding. It was my sister. She rushed inside her face pale with concern. I threw my arms around her, clinging to her as if she were my last lifeline. He's here, I whispered, my voice choked with tears. He's back. She didn't say anything. She just held me tight, her touch a source of comfort in the storm of fear that had engulfed me. We sat there, talking for hours, trying to make a plan. I knew I had to leave California. I had to disappear. He would find me if I stayed. We decided to move to a different state, a place where I could start over, where I could finally feel safe. We packed my car, my sister helping me to carry boxes, her presence a shield against the fear that still gnawed at my soul. We drove for hours, the miles stretching out before us like a promise of a new life. We talked about everything and nothing, just trying to keep my mind off the fear that shadowed my every thought. We finally arrived at a small town in the Midwest, a place my sister had found online. It was a quiet, unassuming place, far from the hustle and bustle of California. It was a place where I could hopefully find a fresh start, a place where I could begin to heal. We found a small apartment on the outskirts of town and started unpacking. 
As I unpacked, I tried to find a sense of hope, a sense of peace. I had to believe that this was a new beginning, that this was a place where I could be safe, where I could finally escape the nightmare that had haunted me for so long. But the fear, the paranoia, the constant feeling of being watched, didn't go away. It still lingered, a shadow that followed me everywhere. I tried to ignore it, to push it down, but it was always there, just beneath the surface, ready to resurface at any moment, reminding me of the danger, reminding me of David. I started to see him everywhere. I'd see a truck that looked like his, parked across the street from my apartment. I'd see a man who resembled him, walking down the street. I'd hear a voice on the phone that sounded familiar, a voice that sent chills down my spine. The fear was becoming unbearable. I couldn't sleep at night, afraid that he was lurking in the shadows outside my window. I couldn't go out, afraid that he would see me and follow me home. I couldn't even look at a truck without a wave of panic washing over me. I started to withdraw from the world, shutting myself in my apartment, my only contact with the outside world through the television. I was becoming a prisoner in my own home, a hostage to the fear that had taken root in my soul. I knew I had to do something. I couldn't live like this, afraid of my own shadow. I had to find a way to overcome the fear, to find a way to reclaim my life. I started therapy again. I had stopped going a few months after moving to California, but I knew I couldn't live with this fear any longer. I needed help. I started to talk about my experiences, about the rape, about the stalking, about the phone calls, about the fear that had consumed my life. I talked about everything, pouring out my soul to the therapist, hoping for some kind of relief, some kind of understanding. The therapist listened patiently, offering empathy and support. She helped me to understand that the fear I was experiencing was a normal response to the trauma I had endured. She helped me to develop coping mechanisms to learn how to manage the fear, to find ways to reclaim my life. It was a long and difficult process, but slowly, I started to feel better. I started to go out more, to engage with the world again. I started to feel like myself again. I started to feel like I was healing. I started to feel safe again. The phone calls stopped. The fear started to fade. The nightmares began to disappear. I got a job at a local bookstore. I made friends, joined a book club, and started to feel like I was finally putting my life back together. I no longer lived in fear. I was finally free. Or so I thought. One day, I was working at the bookstore when I saw a truck pull into the parking lot. It was a beat-up Ford F-150, with a dented bumper. My heart stopped. I knew it was him. I knew he was back. I turned to run, my legs trembling but I was frozen in place. My eyes met his, and I saw the same cold, menacing look that had haunted my nightmares for years. He was smiling, a cruel, predatory smile that sent a wave of terror washing through me. I knew they had been following me, driving past my apartment, watching me. They had been there all along, lurking in the shadows, waiting for their chance. I knew I had to run. I ran, my legs pumping, my breath coming in ragged gasps, my heart pounding like a drum in my chest, but it was no use. He was faster. He grabbed me, his grip tight and unrelenting. He dragged me to the back of the bookstore, into the dark and silent depths. And the nightmare began all over again. Mm -hmm.